this morning. Somebody say amen. amen. Glad you're alive and well. Welcome to Believers Fellowship. It's your first time here. We're glad that you're a part of our worship service. Uh, I've been preaching a series, for those who have been here, on apostasy for the last six, eight weeks. And I'm going to continue with that, but not today. <laughs> and uh, give you all a chance to breathe from what you can loosen your seatbelt up a little bit, maybe. Uh, but it's been a very powerful series and descriptive of the days that we're living in. So uh, I'm going to move aside from that and just do something else today. Also, next Sunday is our anniversary Sunday. I know you're pumped up and excited. Hope you are planning to bring everybody you know with you. Amen. That you're getting family and friends and relatives and old church members and backslidden church members and front slidden church members and anybody else you can get. It's going to be a great, great day in the Lord. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, in fact, it's going, to be, it's going to be about from 10 to 4. All right. No, you won't have to listen to me all that time. But uh, it's going to be lots of music, lots of fellowship, food, all kinds of activities on the ground. So it's going to be, you know, we've been talking about for weeks. I hope you've made every plan to get ready for that because it is going to be going to be a phenomenal time. You know, I want to share today uh, something different. I, I want to, in fact, start today uh, and share my testimony. I I've done this three times at Believers Fellowship in 25 years, shared my testimony. And, but I don't want to share it the way I've shared it in the past, all right? Not that I'm making up a new testimony. I know some people have those kind of testimonies. Uh, most people, when they, they get up to share their testimony about how they met the Lord, it's usually, here's where I was, here's what I was, and here's what I did, and, you know, God saved me. And they tell about when they got saved and how they met the Lord, the, the, the moments that impacted them to give their life to Christ. Uh, I, I want to start after that. Every time I've shared my testimony, it's what I call the BC days, the before Christ. You kinda, and, and it's good to share that because a lot of people see the power of God and what God can do in somebody's life. But I want to share the, the A.D. days, the, the after the death, because the day that I gave my life to Christ was the day I died, but also came alive in Jesus. It, it, for those of you considering suicide, this is a better way. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you're, if you're having thoughts of suicide, it, it, the best way you deal with that is, is do what I did. You go to Jesus, you lay down your life before him and say, this stinks, it's worthless, I can't go on another day like this, forgive me, cleanse me, and new life comes because of Jesus Christ. In fact... The scriptures make it very clear. If any man is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. New creation. In other words, you're not what you used to be. You've heard me say it before. If you are what you've always been, you're not a Christian. In other words, God does a change in your heart somewhere down the line. It's a change of ownership. It's a change of direction. It's a change of, in eternity. God just works a, a change in all our hearts. For some, it's more dramatic than it is for others. But the idea is that you're changed. You are not what you used to be. God does something special in your life. So I want to start, uh, just kind of give you a little uh, idea how, how really ancient I am. I want to start in 1973. I gave my life to Jesus September 27th, 1973. Result of a lot of people praying. My, a mom who, who loved God would pray for me. A brother who consistently just, in spite of my ridicule, making fun of him, continued to witness to me about the Lord, bringing me to, to the place of just desperation in my life through all the way that, uh, that God was dealing with my life. If you, if you took my life and you say you want to characterize it, because I don't want to go into all that, I think you could characterize it by certain words. Uh, drugs, party life, alcohol, uh, nightclub, empty, searching, lonely, running. Uh, I, was, I was messed up mentally, spiritually, morally, physically, about every way. I, I, I was a wreck, all right? And I, I, I was a wreck because I'd made a wreck out of myself. I, you, you know, a lot of people want to blame everybody, the circumstances, their parents, or whatever. Hey, you are what you are because you made choices that you made, all right? I mean, a lot of things come in our life, but we still have these choices that we can make and decisions. And I was, I mean, I was just, uh, you know, I, I, I was a mess. And uh, all that was important for me was me. And, you know, I would be interested in you if it would help me. But that's the way that the sin nature is for all of us. The Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. 1973 on a Thursday night, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and things began to radically change. Uh, it was that next day where my brother came to me after uh, leading me to the Lord. He says, why don't you move in with me? He, he had a house on the, uh, the 
Pasadena side of town over in that part of town. He says, you know, I've got this house. We've started doing these, these, these rallies in the weekends. We have a lot of young people come in. We've gotten, we witnessed to people, bring them in. His ministry had been going about a year and a half, and then he had also was doing some revivals. Those doors were opening up, and other areas of ministry were starting. He said, why don't you come on? There's a couple other guys that live there. We're all single guys. We all love Jesus. Come on in. Be a part of what God's doing. So I went in and, and became a part. And, uh, and I, you know, for those who don't know, I was, you know, there really wasn't, when you looked at me, a lot of people say, oh, there's, there's a real shining star. <laughs> in fact, some of you may know the Bonners, you know, Mickey and Margaret Bonner. Mickey's a great man of God, gone on to be with Jesus. She confided to me just a couple of years ago. She says, you know, because when, when, they knew me after I got saved, they met me real close that time. And uh, I had to ask Kathy to be my wife during this, this period of time. And she said, uh, when Kathy told me that she was marrying Joe Arms, I did not say what was on my heart. <laughs> that poor girl is making the biggest mistake of her life. That guy is going nowhere. Now, I would have said the same thing, so I wasn't offended, you know. That, that you know, love is blind, praise God, and a little ignorant, which helps a lot. <laughs> you know, praise God for that. But, but, you know, when, when, I, when I came to Jesus, I, you know, he, he didn't change the way I looked, all right? I still looked pretty much the same, long-haired. You know, people say, well, he's a hippie. You know, I, I didn't get into the hippie thing so much. I wasn't about that. I was more the party thing. You know, let's go get high, let's go and party. And I thought I was the Ayatollah Partiola. But then, then you know, God, God changed all that in my heart and my life. And praise God for faithful people around me, like a, like a brother who led me to the Lord. That's where I met my wife. She had been working with the street ministries there. Uh, it was called Peacemaker, for those who remember those early days. And she had been working with, with Phil some as a, as, a, as a counselor and greeter with the ministries that people come in. And uh, he had a big group of young people that would work there and, and help out and win people to Jesus and do street ministries and stuff. Uh, that's where I met Kathy. In fact, I met her before, you know, it, 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 about a year before I even got saved. And uh, when I first met her, she was in a chair decorating something on the ceiling, and she saw me and fell out of her chair. So I, I have caused a wreck for her ever since. In fact, I have some pictures from early days, if you, if you, you can put them back up on the screen, if you want to shoot them there for me. Uh, that, that was 40 years, you know, ago. And now, next week, we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the church. So I want to deal with this element, you know, before we got into that next week. But just talk about the 40 years and kind of share what the Lord's done in that 40. I got saved when I was three. <laughs> Some of you are still struggling with the math, aren't you? <laughs> Get your calculator. I was 21, just turned 21. I'm turning 21 and when I gave my life to the Lord. And uh, I did meet Kathy there at that ministry. In fact, the Lord really used me in her life. <laughs> One of the guys that was there on the ministry team with Phil had just broken her heart, and they'd broke up. They'd been dating one another. And uh, I had this ministry to her to really help her. <laughs> really, I felt a call, <laughs> among other things. My heart was melting. But anyway, we were married a year and a half or so later. But, and, you know, I, I looked at some of these pictures, and uh, we've been collecting pictures for the 25th anniversary and stuff, and it's, I was going through a whole pictures, you know, piles of stuff, and I, and I saw all these pictures of Kathy. And some of you are familiar. She had this, she's had a real radical heart problem the last year and a half ago, and things, things are much better than what they were. But I, I thought, my Lord, everything I've taken this woman through, it's amazing she's much, uh, even alive, much less heart still beating. <laughs> yeah. This poor woman has had to deal with me. Because, you know, being mildly slow, because I consider myself sometimes, I have a tendency to do things that uh, some, might, some others might not. But here, here's the way that all started, because when I did get my life to Lord, after working with my brother for about a year and a half, and even on a kind of a part-time basis, helping out with the TV ministries that began to blossom and things like that, I, uh, I started doing my own ministry. In fact, uh, I left Phil's ministry and started uh, just doing revivals and rallies. In fact, we, uh, there was a lot of invitations coming in. Uh, the night after I got saved, uh, I, it was a Friday night, and I got up and shared my testimony for the very first time before about 100 young people. And you saw what God could do. And it, you know, I, some people ask, well, when were you called to preach? You know, it was in about, about three or four years into this deal when I, somebody asked me that question, when did God call you to preach? And I thought, yeah, I don't think he did. I think he tricked me into it. Because <laughs> it, it just happened. 
And I believe if, if, if we'll just hear God speak and get busy about doing what God wants us to do, things happen that ordinarily would not happen. If, we're just, if our focus is upon loving God and our focus is upon telling people about the, about the Lord. And that's, that's where it was. When I first gave my life to Jesus, it, 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 there was this passion-driven thing, and it's, hopefully still today, it's just, I, I want to do everything I do because what God's done in my life, the change He's brought, this supernatural life that's available in Christ, the, the love He's given me for Him. I mean, all these things that God has allowed me to be a part of my, hasn't been according to my greatness. All right? There's no... No way that anybody, especially when you hear my testimony, can point to someone and say, boy, aren't they great, you know? Uh, aren't, and they accomplish something because it, it's not like that. It's, it, it brings you back to realize that, man, God is great. He can take anybody. You know, he takes anybody who's willing to let him do something in their life, and he'll do something so supernatural that it will blow their mind. Now, I, I'm always intrigued by people who were like I was for a long time, knowing that I need to get right with God, knowing where I was in my life, what a mess I was, and debating it. Like, oh, I guess God will really wreck my life if I, you know. Hey, look in the mirror. you are wreck already, all right? Some people say, I'm so afraid of failure. You already are there, all right? <laughs> Give your life to Christ. It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a far better than the life you would choose to live without Jesus being at the heart of your life. Those early days of my ministry were marked just by going out and telling people about Jesus, not by having invitations to come preach somewhere. Nobody was going to invite me to start with. All right? I was nobody, long-haired kid, you know, just, you know why, why there's nothing, you know. I told Kathy this morning, I started, started messing my hair up real good and kind of pulled it out a little longer if I could. Wear a T-shirt, put on boots or sandals and, and, and my jeans just to preach there because that was pretty much my attire. You know, that's it, that, that was it. And, and those early days of ministry, you know, Phil wasn't going to let me preach. You know, he's going to preach. So I, I'd just go after we'd be through somewhere. For those who would go with me, we'd go out on the streets. You know, and we'd go down to Market Square. Some of y'all remember those that are old people. You know, that's where the party life used to be in the Houston community downtown. There were Allen's Landing. I mean, you were anybody from homeless people down there to Hollywood actors. I mean, there's all kinds of people together down there. I just go down there and preach. Some nights nobody won't even go with me. Because we didn't even get down there until about midnight because that's when things popped up and started happening. So we would go down there stayed about 2, 2.30 and just witness to people on the streets, talk to people about Jesus, pass out tracks, just, you know, just having fun. That to me was fun. Kathy and I dated, you know. Uh, but we didn't date in the, the standard normal way. I told you I'm a little strange. What do you want to do tonight? Let's go down to Allen's Landing. Let's go to Market Square and witness. Sounds fun. I don't have any drive. I ain't got the money to drive down there now. What are you going to do? Let's go to the bowling now. There's a lot of people there. We didn't go to bowl. Can't stand bowling. <laughs> but there's a lot of people just standing around at the bowling alleys. Go to the park. Go wherever you can. Just find some people and let's meet and let's just, you know, have church. And that, that's, that, was, the, that was the teething grounds of ministry. And it's amazing. People say, well, I believe that God wants to use me. And what they see themselves as is Billy Graham and some big theater somewhere in some big stadium and God's using me. The only one that thinks I'm good as Billy Graham is my mother. <laughs> all right. And she thinks I'm better. All right. <laughs> but the idea, you know, we get no concept of, of what's going on. It, you know, there was, there's been times in my life. In fact, I can point to about three very specifically. When I would just be alone with God and there would be this, and I can't think of any word to, term, to, to put it in terminology or words, it's just an, an encounter. An encountering moment with God in His sovereignty and His holiness. It would leave me in a place of just tears. I, I couldn't do anything, just cry. And just want to be with God more than, than I want to be with, anywhere else. And it's been in those kind of moments early on in my salvation, probably in the six months of my salvation, that I had a moment like that. And more than anything else, I believed it was just a moment of deliverance. Because there was so much garbage in my life and so many things. That, that, and, I, and it was just time of just weeping before the Lord. And I, and I just believe it was a time of freedom where God just set me free from a lot of stuff. Another time was about a year and a half, about a year after I'd left my brother's ministry, going out on our own, starting a ministry. Kathy and I just setting out and believing God. It was, uh, I was at the house alone. We lived on the south side of, of Houston. Had my Bible out. I'd been listening to a Manly Beasley tape. Some of you may be familiar with Manly Beasley. He'd been preaching a message on faith. But I was reading my, my Bible, and I was just telling God, you know, God, I have no idea. I'm just, I, I don't even know what I'm doing here. I just know I want, I want you to do something with me. If, there's any, if you can do anything with me, you know, because there's a lot of folks who didn't think God could do anything with this, then I, I just, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to be Billy Graham. <laughs> you know, I, I just want what you want for my life. 
And it was one of those moments where he just, you know, God just shows up and he, and he just starts speaking and he starts ministering to your heart. And it was just one, you know, it wasn't an audible voice, and it wasn't had to do with necessarily the motions. It's just that I knew that, that I was in the presence of the Lord. And there's really just one thing that, that God was saying to me in, in all that, and that was that word believe. In fact, I kind of put down in a nutshell what that moment was all about. And, and I believe this is true for anybody who just be broken and willing to let God just clean their life up and be broken before God. You know, and you want to know what God's wanting to do. I think, number one, if you, you, you just got to get the place in your life. You just, I, I, I want to hear God speak. You know, I'm not interested in popular opinion. I'm not interested in, you know, in what somebody at church laid their hand on me and said, this is what God wants to do, Lord, God wants to do. You know, not interested in that. Not interested in, you know, in, 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 in what mama wants or the deacon. I want to know what you want. Second part of that is God will speak. The second part of that is, will I believe? And that's where the Lord was doing it. Will I believe him? Well, I believe him. God didn't show me a long-term plan. I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen the next day, much less the next year. All right? I just know I wanted, I wanted God to use me. But there, there was this element to the whole thing that I felt the most impressed about the Lord is, whatever I say to you, you want to believe, but it will be demonstrated with obedience. That's genuine belief. Don't say you believe if you don't obey. It's not belief. It's not faith. You know? That the faith without works is what? It's dead. So there has to be this part of our life and this, this commitment of our heart. We say, I really want God to speak to me. We would say, God, I, I want you to say something. I want you to do something. And, I, and I, I, I need you more than anything else at this particular time in my life. And of all that had gone on in those early days and all that had gone on in those early moments, this is what it really boiled down to in my life and what it really boils down to in everybody's life. I don't care who you are, what your background is, what your nationality is. If, if you're really wanting the Lord to do something, I, I think this is just generic for every one of us. And its, it's theme is throughout Scripture. All right? It's what everything hinges on. Will I trust? Will I believe? And if I do say I trust and I believe, then will I obey the Lord? That's how you get saved. All right? That was the element that I didn't want to face before I got saved. Amen? But once you do make the surrender of your heart and you do give your life to Christ, and it's going to come down to this. And then that night, in that moment, in that afternoon, I just had this, this to get to this point... Again, this is all conditioned on a broken or a clean heart to respond to God's word. Will you do what he wants you to do? Will you do what he wants you to do? And everything that I've ever seen success in my life in, in my family in, or even in my children in, in my church in, my personal life in, my marital life in, your everything. This principle applies to everything across the board. Wherever you're at right now, are you willing to have a heart that's surrendered, broken before God and clean before God, and that you'll be willing to hear what God's going to say to you? And then when he speaks it, will you embrace it and then obey it? It's pretty simple. And this was, you know, praise the Lord for, for people around me that, you know, that, that God blessed me with. I shared about my brother leading me to the Lord and then introducing me to people in life like Manly Beasley's and Mickey Bonner's and Bill Stafford's and guys that were, were deeply in love with Jesus Christ. That it, it all came back to this. If you're, if you're in a place in your own life today and say, you know, I just, I don't know what's, I don't know where, I don't know what. Maybe it's in your marriage or in your finances. I don't know. But I think you can come back to this. And because of this one thing, if you can embrace it, your past won't make any difference to it. Your personality has anything to do with this. Your position in life doesn't have anything to do with this. It all gets down to it. what is God going to do and will you let God do something in your life. And because of just this simple principle, God has allowed me to do things that I never, ever thought I would be able to do or be able to participate in. I've been in hundreds of churches. I've been in revivals. I've been in seminars. I've been on tours and conferences. I've been ministering in over 20 different countries around the world on several continents. God's given me opportunities to do revivals and crusades and ministries. And again, you're talking about that stupid looking little hippie kid. All right. I had a high school diploma. But if you get back to this point, it doesn't matter. God chooses the weak. God chooses the foolish. God chooses those things that are not to confound those things that are. There were so many better preachers, and there still are so many better preachers, so many better looking preachers, so many more talented preachers. But you have to throw all that out and say, I don't, I'm not here to fit a form. 
I just want to do what God wants me to do. I, I'm not really interested in being the pastor of the megachurch. I'm not interested in being, you know, the, the, the leader of the band. I just want to do what God wants me to do. And can I get to the places of being broken and clean before God and say, God, do that and let me be a part of it. Funny part about that is, is that God has put me in the circle of all those people who are the talented, who are the blessed, who are the educated, who are the degrees. I serve on mission boards with professors and deans of seminaries. One mission board has two deans of, minist- of, of seminaries on it. And it's always fun to go around them and act like I know more than they do. It just bothers them. <laughs> but it's interesting to note, there's times they call me. And to me, that, that's, that's, you know, that's confounding. That's baffling. But again, it gets back to, well, well, I hear God speak and will I obey God? Let me tell you the funniest thing about this. I'm 30 years old. I still don't know what I'm doing at 30. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what I'm doing today, all right? Some of you are wondering if I knew, I don't. You know, I'm just taking it day by day, step by step. Let's see what God's up to. Let's hear what God says and let's go do that. Amen. That's the way we should operate in our life. God opens the door, and I become a, a, one of the, 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 uh, uh, an officer on the Conference of Texas Baptist Evangelists, which is the largest conference of evangelists in the United States. You know, four years serving there, two years as president. You know, what are you doing? I don't know. I'm being the president. They told me I was the president, so bless God, I'm the president. You know, but what I'm saying, it gets back to this, it's not about some personality. It's about what God will do when somebody does what he says. And I, was, I had the opportunity to see it molded and, and fashioned by others who led me to the Lord, went before me in the Lord, and, and, and showed me this simple, particular pattern. After working with Phil for about a year and a half, two years, and then uh, I even went with uh, and helped start a, a coffeehouse ministry similar to that in, uh, in uh, Phil's wife's dad, Bill Mormon. I went out and worked with them about a year and a half, and we started a, a similar coffee house ministry called the Freeway Manor. Some of you may, may remember Freeway Coffee House, something like that. You may remember that over in the, the Humble District. We did it for a year. Then when we left there, is, God was starting to lead some, open some more doors and starting to do revivals at this time, and crusades at this time were starting to come in here and there, and seminars and youth camps and things like that. that about that time, after about four or five years in ministry, I, I went to Kathy and I said, you know, uh, I've really had a word from the Lord, what we're supposed to do. She was still working full time at this time. All right? And I said, God wants you to quit what you're doing and so you can be with me as, I, as, I, as we do these different ministries. She was making very good money and she looked at me like I'd lost my mind. She looked at me a lot like that over the years. <laughs> so I know the look very well. I think you've lost your mind. It was the same kind of look when I walked up to her in 1986 and I said, this was two years before the church started, I think the Lord wants us to start a church. That same look. <laughs> like, you've got to be out of your mind. What are you eating? You know, what, are you, what are you taking here? The idea was it, was, it was a moment when God just told us to do it. We went to, to Magnolia area. We started a coffee house ministry there, working on the streets on the weekends, and then moved it over to spring later on. And the interesting thing, and just to give you a little insight, nobody's standing by with money to give us. All right? Nobody's standing by with money to give us. And again, you know, I just, I just saw Phil came in a while ago, but this is, this is where I appreciate, you know, him putting me under some people as a, as a young believer in the Lord. He wasn't much older in the Lord than I was, but us being exposed to some men who taught us how just to hear God speak, believe God, and obey God. And just see what God would do in those kind of situations. I remember I came to Spring Baptist and I was trying to tell the pastor so he wouldn't have a heart attack when he, when I, he found out I was in the area. Just let him know what we were doing. We were going, we were going to start a, a youth ministry on, on Fridays and Saturday nights in spring. And uh, he kind of, oh, that's great, you know, and he, he was just kind of welcome. He was nice and cordial. He called his youth pastor and he said, well, you're, you're going to need a location, right? I said, yeah. He didn't offer me his. But anyway, uh, he put his youth pastor, why don't you go drive around the area? Well, we get in the car, drive down about five blocks away from the church, and all of a sudden we're in Old Town Spring. And if you, if those who've been in Old Town Spring, you know, when, as soon as you go into Old Town Spring, the, ro- the road split off, right, like a Y. And there's this building that says Dead Center, right in the middle, and it was a courthouse. It had been a church at one time years ago, and they'd re- you know, redesigned it and made a courthouse out of it. The back offices of the courthouse were, were like a, a police station for the, for the sheriff's department. Had a, a little station back there. And so as we're driving by, man, man, something just quickened in my heart. said, that's the place. That's the building. So I turned to the guy. I said, hey, pull in there. He said, no, no, that's, that's not the place. I said, that is the place. He said, that's a courthouse. I said, I don't care. That's the place. 
He said, no, it's a courthouse and the cops have their offices back there. Pull in there. It's, there's no sign up, Joe. There's not, there's not for lease. It's not for sale. That's the place. So he finally pulls in. He went and showed me two or three other places first. I'm not paying any attention. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. <laughs> Heading back to church. That's the place. Pull in there. He finally pulls in. I go in and, you know, there's, you know the courthouse has already been empty. They're not using that section of the building. The back offices, there's a couple of cops or sheriffs in there. and said, what are y'all doing in my office? They didn't see the humor in it either. But <laughs> <laughs> this is the place. I said, and we got to talk. He said, you, well, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, he said, we are, you know, we're, we're closing this office down. And, you know, I'm sure this building's going to be empty. Uh, so we started doing some research and found out that it is a community owned. It was a, it was a county owned property. And when the county sells or leases something, it always has to go to auction. So we heard there was going to be an auction and we got all the information on it. And what they do, they take you downtown, put everybody in the big room in the, at the county courthouse downtown. And they start calling out properties that have been tax sales and all that kind of stuff. They finally came to our place, you know, and in, in, in downtown spring, you know, I'm looking around, by the way, I went with a check in my pocket. I probably only had $100 in the checking account. I was dirt poor, you know. Even the church mice wouldn't ask me for anything. <laughs> They'd leave the cheese for me. All right. So <laughs> I go downtown. Kathy's with me. We go into the lobby down. There's all these people in there. And I think, oh, Lord. But I had a word. So they start the bidding. Everybody cheer for the bid for such and such building. Old Town Spring, please come forward. We're the only ones that step forward. You know, I said, what's, what's up with this? You know, and they said, the bidding begins at $100. I got $100. <laughs> I'd prayed up $100. We rented that building for $100 a month for several years. And it was just a grace thing and a grace moment. And here, here's the point I want to get to. If God's telling you to do something in your life, don't be waiting for somebody to stand around and finance it for you. God's leading you to do something. Don't wait. And here's what I hear so many times. People say, oh, I'm just waiting for the door to open. Why do you think the doorknob's for? <laughs> Put your hand on the knob and turn it. You want God to open the door too? If the door, and if it's locked, then you can just leave it alone. Okay, maybe God doesn't want you to go through it. But the idea is, you know, you hear from God. Now, this isn't, this isn't saying like, oh, I have a plan. I've got some ideas. This is what I want to do. I want this ministry. And you see some ministries out there. And I, I, you know, I, I'm going to be the next Billy Graham or whatever it is. And that's what I'm going to do. That doesn't work. You know? Next year is a church. We're going to celebrate 20. I mean, next, next week. We're going to celebrate 25 years as a church. Do you know how many churches have closed in 25 years? Since the day we open to the, to the day we celebrate our 25th, there'll be close between 150 to 170 thousand churches that will close their doors. God's blessed us because it starts with a word from him and God blesses his word. And it's just the point where we believe what God says. Will we come to the place to hear what he says, believe what he says, and obey what he says, and if we'll do that. Now, we weren't the kind of people, I wasn't the kind of guy, and the people who started ministering with us and coming in and ministering with us and participating in ministry with us, and, you know, we weren't, we weren't sitting around. You know, my calendar wasn't full, all right? You know, there, nobody was looking for this sterling, wonderful evangelist at this particular party of my life, you know? And so we did, when we weren't doing the Friday and Saturday night ministries, we'd just do something else. On several occasions, we rented football fields. If they want to ask me to come to a crusade, I'll do one anyway. <laughs> we'd go in, invite all the youth ministries and pastors of the church to participate if they want to participate. We, we rented Aldine High School, you know, the big stadium there in Aldine Westfield, right there, that area, that stadium right there. We rented that twice. We bring in people like Wayne Watson and Jeff Bimbert and other bands and other stuff. And we'd set our, our people out in our ministry. We'd just start inviting everybody we knew and their dogs and cats and everything we could come up with. And we'd see hundreds of people come to know Jesus Christ. We were in a Tomball High School auditorium one time like this, just inviting people to come in. It's the, the idea of too many people sitting around waiting for an invite or waiting for cash to drop out of heaven before they ever let God do something. You know, I hear people sitting in church like, oh, I just want to do something in church, but nobody asked me. Get busy. Quit. You know, you got something God's put on your heart. Let's get after it. I'll help you with it. But don't be sitting around, you know, waiting for somebody to post a sign. There's already been given a clear word, and it's pretty simple. Let's go. And because if, if, we, can, if we can just get to this point and say, I'll hear what God says, and I'll believe what God says, and then I will obey what God says, there's no end how many doors that God will open for you. 
And that's in jail ministries, that's in revivals, that's in Bible studies, it's in, it's in food pantries, it's in clothing pantries, just any kind of ministry that's out there that God wants to do. He will open the doors for you. I mean, there's so many other things that I could go into that God has done and God has seen done. So much of it, we don't have the time for this morning, but most of it has been, it's, every one of it, part of it has been a faith step. Nobody's come up with the cash to start with. I remember Camille came to me. Uh, she'd been in Scotland and doing ministry over in Scotland. Camille's my sister. Wave your hand, Camille. Peter. She came to me. She said, you know, I have these preachers in England. They, 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 want, they want an American preacher to come over and do some revivals. And, you know, I'll set them up if you'll do it. Let's do it. I didn't have any money, but I felt like the Lord wanted us to do it. She didn't have any money. She's poorer than I was. <laughs> and Phil wouldn't give me any more of his. <laughs> So we just started praying, this Lord's will, he'll provide. And he did provide. But in the process while we're praying, there's a young man who gives his life to Jesus, all right, from Norway in our street ministry. Some of those in those early days, his name was Trules, all right? I think he goes by David now. It's easier to say in English. But he came to my office. He said, you know, I got a problem. He said, I've, I've been in the country a year and a half, and I just got saved a couple of weeks ago. He said, I've got to go before the immigration board. And he said, I, I lied on all my entrance papers. I said, at least you filed some. All right, that's a good start. <laughs> He said, I like it. And when they find out that I don't have the sponsors that I said I had, they're going to send me back to Norway, and I don't want to go back to Norway. So what should I do? I said, you're really wasting my time here, aren't you? So what do you mean? He said, you know what to do. He kind of said, yeah, I know what to do. Be honest, be truthful. So that's it. Just go be truthful. What, what if I don't work? He said, if God sends you back, it's for a purpose. There's going to be some great work or ministry God have you do. So he sent back. Meantime, I put out a newsletter. He finds in his newsletter that he gets overseas that we're going to be going to England. All right? So he shoots me a note and says, you've got to come to Norway. Because if you're just, when you come into London, make a left <laughs> straight over the, the, the sea there. You know, the North Sea is Norway. Stavanger's right there. And come, to, come do some meetings there. We'll set it up. Well, we just barely had the money to get to England. In fact, we didn't have all the money we needed. The day before we go, this is back in the day, you could go back to the airport and actually buy tickets at the airport and pay for them, get on the plane that day and that kind of stuff. We decided we would change and, you know, uh, if God would supply the need. Well, the day before we leave for the airport, we, we've already made the reservations. Everything's set in stone. We just need to pay the money at the airport. Well, the day before we leave, here's the rest of the money comes in for the Norway portion of it. Meanwhile, I have told him we were coming. He didn't know we didn't have any money. I didn't want to scare him. He's already prepared everything. He's gone into Stavanger, Norway, where they had what was called Bedehusens, which is the word for prayer houses. And he's rented a couple of these prayer houses for a night or two. And each one of them, he's, he's, he's invited youth choirs. That was a big thing in Norway at that time, youth choirs. He'd be 100, 200 kids. He'd invite three or four of those youth choirs to come. He'd fill the house up every night. You know? So we went in first, went to Norway. Got in Norway, praise the Lord. Had lots of people saved. Hundreds of people came to know Jesus. Great time. And then it's time to go to England. We have the tickets to get into London, but I didn't have the heart to tell Camille and Kathy that was with us. I didn't have money for a hotel once we got to London to spend the night, or for I had the train ticket money to get down to. We were going into Devon, the southern part of England. You know, once we got down there, I didn't have any money. You know, it's going to be a straight faith deal. Now we'd had dinner one night after one of the meetings at a, at a, at a young Norwegian guy and his wife's house, and he was a dairy farmer, him and his family were, and they put out all this food, and there was this, this neat little, he had this big cheese block, a Norwegian cheese, a Norwegian Gouda, and he had this nice, beautiful cheese slicer, you know, and a nice, you know, one of those porcelain handles on it with the blue, like you see in Amsterdam, all that stuff. I said, I said, I'd like to get one of those for my wife. I'm thinking about it, and I don't have money for it, but I'll just be nice, talk about the cheese handle. You know? Anyway, so <laughs> I said, I'd like to get one for my wife, and he said, uh, he said well, I'll look around. So the day we're going to the airport, he, he meets us, he says, hey, you can get this to your wife later. He said, but I got, I got a cheese slicer for you. you know, so he said, in fact, I put some cheese in there. He said, so you take this and take the cheese and just enjoy it on flight. Nobody knows about our dilemma but Jesus and me. We get on the plane. I said, that cheese sounds pretty good. So I present the cheese slicer to Kathy. It opened up, there's some cheese in there. There wasn't a lick of cheese in there. But you know what there was? There was a bunch of cash. American dollars. Hundred dollar bills. <laughs> it was enough to take care of the hotels, enough to take care of the, of the food, getting back from London, back down to Devon, back to Devon, back to London, back to London, back to Houston. Everything was needed. Now, that's just the grace of God. 
It gets down to the simple thing in every one of our lives. It's not any different, no matter where we're, where we're in full-time ministry or not. It's the simple thing, am I believing God? Am I going to trust God? And it, you know, I can't tell you how many times as a family during those early years, we didn't have insurance. I mean, we went through three miscarriages and two baby births without a lick of insurance. Y'all know how much that cost even back then. God met every need Every time, nobody was owed a dime. Everything was taken care of. I remember, I'm at the hospital, and I know they're ringing up the bill in the other room when my daughter was born. About that time, as a pastor came in, he said, oh, by the way, he said, I don't, I don't want you to worry about, he said, uh, the birth, the cost of your baby and all the things involved. He said, uh, we want, uh, our church wants to take care of that. Nobody had told him about anything. It was just another miraculous moment in time when God's given the opportunity to do something that he will do something. But too often we're sitting back with our fears. I'm just, I just don't want to fail. Most of our lives are failure if we don't know Jesus and if we're not walking with Jesus. Do we, do we want to be bound to the realm of what's easy and logical and reasonable the rest of your life when God's calling you to something far deeper? It was in 1986 when the Lord started putting on our heart to, to start a church. It was then that we, you know, took two years to really seek God's face and believe, see if this is what God wanted, because it would mean stopping everything we were doing. I wasn't going to try to do revivals in church, too. So I don't know if I'm going to commit myself to this, I'm going to commit to it all the way if this is what God wants. We'd already gone to this, the, the Southern Baptist associations and the locally and asked if they wanted to be a part of sponsoring us. Well, my last name is Arms. That's not a popular word among liberals, all right? Uh, whether it was Phil or me and serving in a, the service of the Texas evangelist, back in those days in the Baptist church, there was a controversy that was going on. Every other denomination prior to us would seem to just drift into liberalism. The churches would make statements that they didn't believe the word was inerrant and fallible. You know. But there was this fight going on for the convention and the control of the convention by conservatives. It's time to get rid of that liberal element or we're going to go the way of the rest of them. And we don't want to do that. So there was this controversy going on. Those who lived in Houston and even in the southern United States during those days know the conflict that went on and led by people like Paige Patterson and, you know, uh, other people who just stepped to the front and said, we're going to fight this battle. W.A. Criswell, those some great men of God. In preaching, wherever we went, whatever we did, we we're always preaching the word of God is inerrant and fallible. It's accurate. I mean, it's the word of God. It's reliable. You can build your life on it. You can trust God to do what he said he would do. So this fight is going on. Is the Bible infallible? Is it inerrant or not? So that name one alone didn't go good about them being a part of being a Baptist church. And then they sat down with their local little associate guy who said, well, you know, this, our, our, we can't support you because your vision's too big or because, you know, what we want to do, we want to find where new churches, we only want to plant churches in front of subdivisions. So when there's a subdivision come up, we want a church there. We want a church to run about 100 people, and that's, that's pretty much what we want to do. They said, we're using the, we're using the McDonald's mindset. I thought the Bible was a pretty good mindset, but anyway. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't hit it off. We, we parted our ways, went our ways, so we're in a situation now. We're going to believe God, and we're going to start with nothing. You know? And guess what? We called some meetings. And people started showing up. Praise God for my family being so large. <laughs> with Christy and Charity and Terry and them coming to the meetings. And, and, then, and praise God that Pansy Black's had a couple of boys and family members. Pansy's sitting back there today. They, they were part of this whole thing that started off with, with Ricky as associate. I mean, it was just, it was, it, God just started putting things together so supernaturally, you know. And Ricky and I's salary, you know, was, was zero those first, first months, you know, just stepping out and believing God to see what God would do. You know what God did? He did something supernatural. And there's been several things in my, times in my life where I just knew, you, and every one of us that's walked with the Lord at all understands this, I believe. We just knew you heard from God, you know. And, and one of those times was in marriage. Another time was in, you know, in, in starting the different ministries and starting the church. And even when we started, you know, the other campus church, the other, the other location, I just knew in my heart that that was what God wanted to do. And when you get to that point when you know something is what God wants you to do, that's the time to do it. You don't put it off. You don't hesitate. You just move forward. We started, and it was just, and I'll close with this little incident. When we started the church, we moved forward and said, we're going to be what God wants us to be and do what God wants us to do. 
Started meeting in a hotel, went from schools there, went to roller skating rinks and all those different stories. Some of you know that the whole story had operated. But the idea is that even before we ever started our own church building, we helped build five other churches in the period of time before we even started our own building. The first time we started our Ford in Faith, all right? We started the Ford in Faith building program. We're going to start setting money aside and challenging people to give. So one day we went to buy some property and then we went to build a building on it. Let's do what we can to get ready for it. I think we had a grand total of maybe $5,000 that first few months or so. And then there was somebody in our church that was afflicted that needed a serious surgery and a transplant. You know, and the Lord just told us to give that away. You know, just, just to give away. You always reap when you sow. Amen. You always do. If you don't sow, you don't reap. Now, sometimes you reap later than you sow, but you do, you do reap. Let me say this also. You also reap what you sow, so be careful what, you, what you're going to sow because you reap what you sow. We are about 90 days away. This property and buildings were probably appraised about $2 million a day. We're about 90 days away from paying that all off. In fact, we could do it today if you want to write the check, all right? It's not that much, some of you. But we're that, you know, that, it's just been one testimony after another. And I never had it in my mind to try to duplicate something. I had some great role models, some great preachers, some great men who stood before us, great, great evangelists, great crusade leaders. I mean, in, in near circles and far. But I... I was advised by some smart people. Don't do anything but what God wants to do in you. Don't try to be like anybody but what God wants to do in you. If you can do that, then you'll, you'll be successful. Not, sex, not successful in the terms of men. But I want you to know I feel like I am the most successful man in the world. What God has blessed me with the church I'm a part of, the people that are my friends, the people that sow and that, that work and, and work this field together with me, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my family, my children, my grandchildren. I, I'm blessed, you know. I, I, I just, you know, it, I don't think it could get any better. I mean, we're living in a plague, sin, plague, filthy world. You know, and I feel like I've got a little piece of Eden it's not without problems, all right? And it's not without difficulties, and neither will yours be. There's a lot of heartaches. There's a lot of pains. There's a lot of failures. There's successes. But God's faithful. Amen. Don't forget that God is faithful. And if you can do what we say, hear God speak. Believe what he says to you. And then let it be marked by obedience. What can I do? To obey you. How can I obey you? And I believe that God will give you, as much as he gives you that word of faith, he'll show you what that work of faith is. Sometimes it's just simply praying. Sometimes it's, it's, it's telling others. Sometimes it's just simply promoting it to other people. I, with that building in Old Town Spring, you know what it was for me? What, what, I asked, Lord, what can I do to show him work of faith? So I just go to the auction with my $100. You know, I, and I, we went ahead and printed all our, uh, we changed our address for our offices and locations. We printed up all new stationary business cards and everything before we ever had the building. <laughs> We're moving to spring. This is our new address. <laughs> That's the only work of faith I knew to do. What is it God's telling you to do? Then ask him, how can I demonstrate? How, what steps of action can I take? You may not know where you're going. Like I say, God didn't show me the 40-year plan. But you just go. Because the joy is always in the journey. Not in the arrival. Because when you stand before the Lord, He's not going to say, I'm so glad you got here. He's going to say, well done. The journey was right. Paul said, I ran the race. I kept the faith. It's the process of day by day living for Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, this is your day. This is your moment. I'm, I'm not going to give a, an, an altar call this morning, but I do want you to bow your heads right there where you're at. And I want you to maybe just acknowledge to the Lord anything he may have said to you from, from this testimony today.